Oh, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's an absolute privilege to be with you here today. So thank you to the trustees, the staff, the volunteers. Um, I think we'll all agree it's been a fantastic day. I've spoken to many of you during the breaks and I think it's the first conference for lots of us, isn't it? Um, so I've certainly taken a lot already from today and I hope to add to that for you. Um, I should say at the beginning, um, I'm very happy to answer questions at the end and I'll leave plenty of time for that. Be aware that I don't know your personal health histories. I don't know your diagnosis. So um, I will try and make my responses to your questions as generic as possible so they, they answer questions for all. Um, but do feel free. I'm around for the whole day, and I'm very happy to stay at the end of the day. So if you have specific questions about your own personal um, cardiac history, um, do catch me at the end of the day. I'm not rushing off afterwards. So in my role as a physiotherapist and cardiac rehab lead, um, I have the absolute privilege of working every day with people with heart disease of all shapes and sizes. Um, and my role is really to inform and empower people to be as active as possible. And that's very much what I hope to do today. I'm also aware that for many of you in the room, you may already be very active, but there'll be those of you who are less active than you'd like to be. And very often, for people with cardiomyopathy, the issue is that you're not quite sure what's safe to do, that your concerns that, as well as benefits of exercise, there are genuine risks. And for many people, the fear of those risks overpowers the benefits, and you end up less active than you'd like to be. So I'm hoping today we can talk about benefit and risk, and at the end, you'll feel more informed about how to go about exercising safely. Now, the things I focused on today are the things that I get asked all the time. So I'm hoping that some of the questions you might be asking and you might want answered fall into this list. We're going to talk about why we should be active, not just for our heart, but for our overall health and how do we go about getting all of those benefits. Mostly, how do we keep it safe? There's some very real um, practical take-home points I've got for you around that. I have focused on possibly some of the most common cardiomyopathies and some very specific advice for each one. I'm aware that I haven't covered all of them. We'll talk about exercising with devices, particularly defibrillators. We'll talk about exercising in water, swimming, aqua aerobics, very popular. And then we'll get a bit more practical. How do we get started? If I'm new to exercise, or I haven't exercised in some time, how do I even get going? And then how do I keep going? So let's just start with some definitions. So we use lots of language around exercise. Let's make sure we're clear on the difference. Physical activity is any form of movement. Standing up from a chair, walking upstairs, that's physical activity, anything where we move our body, anything above rest. Exercise is when we give it a bit of structure. And exercise tends to have a goal in mind. But clearly, there's a bit of overlap. So for some people, walking upstairs will be activity. For people with quite a low functional capacity, then walking upstairs actually may become exercise. So just be aware there are, that those are two different things, but there's certainly some overlap between them. Let's talk about the different types of exercise we might do, and I'll refer to these throughout the presentation. So we talk about aerobic exercise or cardiovascular exercise, exercise that's predominantly challenging our heart and lungs, exercise that makes us a bit warm and a bit puffed. And that can be anything that uses our arms and legs. So that would be walking, cycling, swimming. Yeah. How much should we be doing? The general health message is most days of the week, three to five days a week. Resistance exercise, strength exercise, lifting weights, lifting dumbbells, using cables at the gym, squats, lots of different ways of doing resistance exercise. And increasingly, we're becoming aware it is as important as aerobic exercise for many reasons. Ideally, we should be doing it a minimum of two days a week, up to three if we can. And we should be spreading that exercise out across the week. 
because actually it's important to recover from resistance exercise. So if you give yourself recovery days in between, you'll benefit more from the next time you do it. Balance. Particularly as we get older, all of us can have reduced balance, which increases our risk of falls. So incorporating some form of balance, and that can be something structured like Tai Chi, some forms of um, yoga and Pilates include elements of balance, but there can be some very simple home exercises you can do to improve your balance. So if you're aware that balance is an issue for you, then seek out some exercise that challenges your balance. And then flexibility. Yep, so keeping our muscles uh, long as, as we strengthen them. And flexibility exercise is important because as our muscles get stronger, we want to make sure we maintain the length, often so that we don't develop injuries or musculoskeletal conditions. There's, there's very little evidence about how often we should stretch. So I haven't put numbers next to that. I would suggest every time you do something that uses your muscles, give them a stretch afterwards. Stretch the major muscle groups, hold the stretch for 20 or 30 seconds for each stretch that you do. And then I just wanted to mention exercise intensity because throughout the slides you'll hear me talk about low, moderate and high intensity exercise. So it's important just to define what these are. You'll see on the far left of your slides we talk about sedentary behaviour. Now we're aware that reducing our sedentary activity is as important as increasing our physical activity. And we know from, for health reasons, if during your waking hours, you can be active and on your feet for 50% of that time, then there's genuine health benefits. And we know that during the pandemic, many of us have, for work, often become more sedentary. Some of us are no longer commuting and we've taken out activity. So we know the very real health impacts in terms of sitting and we're all doing it here today, aren't we? So trying to reduce our sedentary behaviour is, is very important. If you can try and be on your feet every hour of the day, even if it's getting up for five minutes and walking around before you sit back down, then there are genuine health benefits from doing that. Light exercise would be mostly your activities of daily living. So things that don't make you particularly warm or breathless, things that you don't find particularly demanding. Moderate intensity exercise is where we begin to get the health benefits. So moderate intensity activity is anything that makes us warm, a bit breathless, but able to talk. And we talk very much about comfortable breathlessness. I hope that makes sense to you. So feeling our breath, comfortable to talk, and comfortable to carry on. Vigorous is more than comfortably breathless. So vigorous is puff that you couldn't hold a conversation easily. You might say the odd word, but you wouldn't manage it for long. And then very vigorous is beyond that. Not many of us um, need to do that. And we'll go on to talk about what's appropriate. But I just wanted to define these terms before we go forward. So why should we keep active? You'll know many of these messages, and I'm not going to dwell for long on this slide. This is for all of us. Whether we have a heart condition or not, there are benefits to being active. All of these benefits you attain when you do regular moderate intensity exercise. So any activity that makes you warm and comfortably breathless will give you these benefits. For some of them, we're not entirely sure why we see the benefit. We don't always understand the physiological mechanisms but we know that they exist through doing quite large-scale studies, often observational studies over several years. We know, for example, with dementia, um, it's all about enhanced brain blood flow, reduction of inflammation, um, and improved plasticity in the brain. But we also know there are lots of other things that contribute to the development of dementia. Hip fractures. We know that regular exercise increases our bone density. And for all of us, men and women, as we get older, we're at risk of reduced bone density, and that increases our risk of fracture. So you'll reduce the risk of osteoporosis, brittle bone disease, and reduce the risk of fractures just by being active. 
We know that exercise is really important for our mental health. And again, whilst there are many things that lead to low mood and depression, we know that those people who are physically active are less likely to be burdened by low mood and depression. And we know that actually, if you go to your GP with low mood, the first thing they should do is, is advise you on exercise instead of giving you medication straight away. The, the evidence is so strong. Coming around to the other side of the slide, we know now there's emerging evidence that there's a reduced risk of certain cancers with being active. Some of that is due to hormonal balance. Some of it is due to not being overweight. And some of it is due to improvement in our immune system and dampening down of inflammation. And then getting up to the part that you're more interested in. So cardiovascular disease. So when we talk about cardiovascular disease, we're talking about atherosclerosis, so furring up of the coronary arteries. That can affect our coronary arteries. It can affect the arteries that go to our brain and increase our risk of stroke. And it can affect the arteries that supply our limbs, causing peripheral vascular disease. And we know that if we've got cardiomyopathy, you're not immune from developing cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And if you've got cardiomyopathy, then I would suggest it's even more important to look after your cardiovascular health. We want to maintain the circulation that's going to your heart muscles. But what about the benefits for our heart? So we know that when we're active, it improves our aerobic or our cardiovascular fitness. And there are lots of complex mechanisms by which that takes place. But what's important to know, if you've got heart muscle issues, is a lot of the changes that take place don't actually affect the heart muscle itself. Very often I'll speak to people who say the pumping mechanism of my heart muscle is reduced. I've got an ejection fraction of below 40%. If I exercise, will that not improve the heart muscle? It's a muscle, it makes sense. That is very logical, and I wish that was true, but it's just simply not. For the majority of us, bar elite athletes, we don't really see significant changes in how the heart muscle pumps when we begin to exercise more. But we do see an improvement in your functional capacity. If you exercise with the right dose, you'll find that you're less breathless, you're less tired, you're able to do more. The changes that are actually happening are happening peripherally. They're happening in your limbs, in your arms, and your legs. They're happening to your peripheral circulation. So your peripheral circulation with training gets more efficient, gets more responsive to whether you're active or whether you're at rest. The endothelial function, so that's the um, mechanism of how your blood vessels work, gets better as well. Your muscles get stronger. And all of those peripheral changes mean that your heart and lungs don't have to work quite so hard for every activity that you do. So as your arms and legs and the circulation supplying them gets fitter, every time you climb up the stairs, your heart and lungs don't have to work so hard, so you don't get so breathless and don't get so tired. That's pretty simplified, but I'm hoping that inspires you to do some exercise. Don't feel disappointed that it's not your heart muscle that's responding, because you will see improvements in your everyday function if you keep active. Reduce risk of arrhythmias. I know that one's very important to many of us. So our heart rhythm is um, determined by something called our parasympathetic and sympathetic systems. So that's our, our autonomic nervous system that controls our heart rate. It's also responding to hormones that are released by our body when we're active or when we're at rest. Those who are regularly active have better parasympathetic tone. And what that means is that you're less likely to have heart rhythm problems. It doesn't mean you won't ever have them, but you're less likely to have a big burden from arrhythmias if you're physically active. Maintaining a healthy weight we know is important for our general health and reduces the burden and the load on our heart muscle, as does having better blood pressure. Better blood pressure comes about because of all those peripheral changes I talked about. So if our blood vessels are functioning better and functioning and they're more responsive to activity, then the load on our heart is less. 
And then we've already talked about the reduced risk of coronary artery disease. And that takes place because exercise has an impact on both our blood pressure and our cholesterol. We're more likely to be at the right weight for our height and we're less likely to be diabetic. All of those things are interlinked and they all reduce our risk of developing coronary artery disease. So if we could all take a pill tomorrow that gave us all this, I'm sure we'd all take it. But it's not that easy, is it? Exercise isn't a pill. Exercise is something we have to choose to do and something we have to incorporate into our lives. So we will talk about how we can go about doing that. But what are the concerns? Some of you may be concerned about disease progression. And that's a very real concern for some people, not all, but some people with certain cardiomyopathies. Many of you will be very concerned about how you might feel when you exercise. Will I feel unwell? Or maybe you have. Maybe you've experienced symptoms when you've been active. And of course, then there's the risk of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Now, I have talked about how we can reduce the risk of arrhythmias by being active, but I will go on to talk about some of the specific cardiomyopathies and the specific risks associated with some of those. But let's talk a bit more generally about how we can all make exercise safer, regardless of what cardiomyopathy you have. Warm-up. So warm-up is the beginning part of exercise. And what we're doing with warm-up is we're starting with a lighter intensity exercise than we intend to do. So as an example, if your exercise is going to be going for a half-hour brisk walk, the warm-up is taking the first few minutes quite slowly. And what's happening physiologically when you're starting gradually is you're allowing your heart rate and blood pressure to come up gradually. The other thing that happens when we warm up is our body begins to release a little bit of adrenaline. That's a normal response. And what the adrenaline does is open up our coronary arteries and ensure a really good blood supply to our heart muscle. So warm up the first few minutes, take it slowly at the beginning, is a really sensible way to start. You're much less likely to develop cardiac symptoms if you start slowly. It's quite important to make the duration of the warm-up proportional to how long you intend to exercise for. So if you're going to do half an hour of exercise, you probably need 10 minutes of warming up. And that 10 minutes is going from rest up towards the intensity you aim to get to gradually. If you're only going to exercise for 10 minutes, then your warm-up doesn't need to be so long. Probably two or three minutes is sufficient. Okay? Getting the exercise intensity right. So we talked earlier about low, moderate, high intensity. For most of us, moderate intensity is what we should be aiming for. So warm and comfortably breathless but we need to get there gradually. If you're very new to exercise, then start with something light. Start with something quite achievable. Make that a habit, make it a routine, make it something that you feel you can manage from an energy levels perspective, <coughs> then begin to increase the intensity. So always start by making exercise a habit, make it part of your day, part of your week. Once it's there and you've prioritized it, then you can work on the intensity. It's very easy to jump right in and start something, and then if it feels too difficult, it will be hard to maintain. A gradual progression, yeah, so don't jump in too quickly. Cool down. Now, cool down is probably the most important component of exercise for those of you with cardiomyopathy. Cool down is quite simply bringing the pace down again slowly, and it's often the bit that's skipped. I finish my exercise straight to the shower or you know, uh, straight to rest. What's happening during cool down is that adrenaline that your body's been producing while you've been exercising is gradually reabsorbed from your bloodstream. You'll then find that your heart rate and blood pressure come down gradually. Much less likely to feel symptoms or feel unwell if you bring the intensity of exercise down slowly. A good rule of thumb is Keep your feet moving till you've caught your breath completely. For those of you that are new to exercise, that might take some time. It might take 10 or 15 minutes. But if you keep your feet moving until you've caught your breath, the muscles in your legs are going to keep pumping that blood 
up to your head, up to your heart, while your heart rate and blood pressure are coming down. If you stop exercise too quickly, that adrenaline doesn't really know where to go, and it can irritate your heart. And that's what can cause arrhythmias. As an example, imagine you leave your house, you see the bus at the top of the road, got to get that bus. You sprint for the bus, or you walk really quickly, faster than you would normally for the bus. How do you feel when you get to the bus? Not good, no warm up. You've gone from rest to exercise very quickly with no warm up. Your heart hasn't had the chance to respond. So you get there and you feel pretty awful, really breathless, can't catch my breath, possibly a bit of chest tightness, possibly a bit dizzy, not good, so no warm up. Then you get on the bus. What do you do when you get on the bus? Do you cool down? No, you sit down because there's buses moving, so you sit down. You sit down, ooh, who's had the swimmy feeling? Yep, dizzy, because I've stopped suddenly and my blood pressure's gone high to low very quickly. So next time, let the bus go, get the next one. Walk gradually up the hill, warm up. Yeah, when you get on the bus, just stand for a minute and keep your calves pumping, and then sit down. That's an extreme example, but it just indicates why you get symptoms when you do, if you don't incorporate warm up and cool down into exercise. Okay, what about resistance exercise, strength exercise? I was asked earlier by some people, I, I've heard it's the new thing to lift weights. It's not new, but we've become increasingly aware of the benefits of incorporating strength exercise. It shouldn't replace aerobic, it should be in addition to. Some key things for everyone, but particularly important if you've got cardiomyopathy, avoid breath holding. It's the natural response when we exercise, when we lift weights that are challenging for us to go, because it actually physically does enable you to lift more. Yep. Men are worse than women, I'll warn you. <laughs> Lift, breath hold, breath hold, breath hold, go down. What's happening when we're breath holding, it's called a Valsalva maneuver, is we're reducing our venous return, so we're stopping the blood returning to our heart. So our ventricle's emptier than it should be, and then we get lightheaded and dizzy. So just don't breath hold. Breathe out with the effort. And often when I'm teaching people this, I get them to blow out to get in the habit of it. Yep, blow out with the effort. So time the breathing, and then once you get in the habit, you won't have to think about it, but the blow out stops you breath holding. Blow out with the effort. Avoid isometric exercise. Isometric just means static hold. So uh, wall squats, those who go skiing, sit against the wall for three weeks, that will sort you out, yep. Um, planks, static hold. The issue with that, it's the Valsalva again. When we exercise muscles through movement, the muscle pump in our body pumps the blood back to our head, back to our heart. When we do muscle strength exercises where we hold a position, we've got less of the muscle pump movement going on, so you've got less blood returning to the heart. So just, I'm not saying no planks, but I'm saying be cautious. Think about how you feel when you're doing it. When you are doing a plank, start with your knees on the floor until you build up your strength. When you are doing a plank, don't breath hold at the same, t oh, sorry, don't breath hold at the same time because you're holding your muscles and holding your breath. So for those of you that aren't very symptomatic when you exercise, doing planks could be safe, but there are safer ways to do it. Whereas for some of you, if you tend to get symptomatic exercising, probably other ways to build up your core than planks. And then choosing the right weight for you actually ties in with the next point about getting the sets and reps right. How do I know how much to lift? If I go along to the gym and I try and lift weights, how do I know which one to pick? They all look very big and heavy. The good weight is one that you can lift comfortably eight to 15 times. If you can't lift away eight times, it's probably too heavy for you. If you can lift it 20, 30 times, you're probably not going to get as much benefit. You're probably better to go up a bit on the weight and drop the reps back down. How do I decide whether to do eight or 15? Eight is more strength, 15 is more endurance. If you're not sure, go in the middle. 
10 to 12. Two to three sets of each exercise. If you follow that guidance with resistance exercise, you cannot go far wrong. Don't breath hold, lift the right weight for you two to three times a week, two to three sets of eight to 15. And strength exercise doesn't have to involve lots of equipment. We can use body weight exercise, sit to stand, great exercise for our thighs and our bottoms. Once you can do sit to stand, then take away the chair and do a squat. Heel raises, going up on our toes. You don't need weights, because your body weight is your weight. You're lifting your entire body above yourself. Yeah, wall presses, love a wall press. Stand against the wall, hands in front of you, leaning in, leaning back, just like a press up on the floor, but a much easier way to start. So there are ways in which you can do exercises at home with no equipment. The British Heart Foundation has some fantastic short videos, 10 minutes long, where you can go on and watch them and build up a really nice strength routine at home. What should I be concerned about? You should not feel any of these symptoms whilst you're exercising. If you do, I suggest you pause your exercise routine and certainly see your cardiologist, have an exercise stress test to try and determine why you're having these symptoms. Make sure you're doing your warm up and cool down and you might find that by doing a warm up and a cool down and getting the intensity right, you actually get rid of these symptoms. But if you still do, then get yourself checked out first before you progress any exercise, because you should not feel any of these things. These things are indicating your heart is not responding in the way it should to the exercise you're doing. So let's look at some of the specific cardiomyopathies. There's some good amount of evidence out there. So either some of the major papers that I've focused on, a lot of the learning is from sports cardiology, but that's okay. There's messages we can take from our elite colleagues that we can apply to exercise that we do in the everyday. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Historically, the recommendations have been very conservative, unfortunately. 10, 15 years ago, people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy were told not to exercise. Don't do anything that makes you breathless. Don't do anything that makes you warm. And unfortunately, that means that a lot of people have become very sedentary. And we know from the more recent evidence that actually that, for most people, that was too conservative. And we can safely participate in exercise, with some exceptions, which I'll come on to. So I would suggest, if you're new to exercise and you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then it's a good idea to be asking your cardiologist to go through this list. Your cardiologist really should be taking a comprehensive personal or family history. So that's a comprehensive history of any symptoms you've had at rest or in exertion, and your family as well. And then reviewing any investigations you've had. So you'll all know these investigations. Many of you will have had them. Our echocardiogram will tell us about the pumping function of our heart. It will also tell us if we've got an obstructive element to our hypertrophy. Our MRI will show us about scarring, although I understand from Professor Elliott's there's a debate about how much scarring actually causes risk and symptoms. And then exercise testing for some people is very appropriate. So having an ECG monitored maximum exercise test will help you understand if there is a sinister nature to any symptoms that you're experiencing. And then, of course, it's important to consider any comorbidities that you might also have. Next, I think you've, we've already heard in some of the talks this morning about the ESE risk score. So these recommendations come from the sports cardiology paper, and you'll see that what they tell us is that participating in competitive sport, so the higher intensity sport, um, is appropriate for individuals that are gene positive but phenotype negative. So we know we have an inherited cardiomyopathy, but we're symptom free. And you've got no um, sort of markers of increased risk. We know that participating in low and moderate intensity exercise is appropriate for people who have um, 
markers of increased risk. So looking at these, the ESE score, as we heard this morning, many of us, um, considers that we have increased risk if we've had cardiac symptoms, unexplained syncope, or survived a cardiac arrest. We have an ESC risk score of above 4% at five years. We have a gradient at rest, so an obstructive element at rest. We have an abnormal blood pressure response to exercise, which you would only know if you've had a monitored exercise test. Or we have exercise-induced arrhythmias. So if you fall into that group, it is quite appropriate to be doing low to moderate intensity exercise. Anything that makes us warm and breathless, as long as we do a warm up and a cool down, and we don't push beyond comfortable breathlessness, that's considered safe. However, participating in high intensity exercise should only be considered if you don't have these markers. So we shouldn't be doing high intensity exercise, exercise that makes us more than comfortably breathless, unless we don't fall into this group. And this is just a, quite a small study. Um, only 136 patients all had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they were randomized to 16 weeks of moderate intensity exercise or no exercise. You wouldn't surprise you to know that the exercise group experienced a significant increase in their exercise capacity. But what's really important to note is there were no occurrences of sustained ventricular arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, and those who had defibrillators didn't have shocks. And thank goodness no one died in either group. But I think what that demonstrates and what other research demonstrates is that arrhythmias do happen in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but they're not particularly associated with exercise. They happen at random events during the day, unfortunately, and we don't fully understand what triggers them. But there isn't a significant association with exercise, except in sports cardiology, so except in very high-intensity exercise. So that's where that guidance comes from. So in summary for hypertrophic, sudden cardiac death does occur, but it is very, very rare. And actually, the benefits of exercise far outweigh the risks However, you should get some individualized assessment, and that's in discussion with your cardiologist. Begin if you're unsure about exercising under supervision. I'll go on to talk later about cardiac rehabilitation, but I'd really recommend asking for a referral or referring yourself. And the risks of avoiding exercise shouldn't be ignored. What about arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? The story is slightly different for this group. We know that in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, you're genetically predisposed for your heart muscle, your normal myocardium, to be gradually replaced with fibrous fatty tissue. And that puts you at particularly high risk of arrhythmias. We know that if you've been very active at a young age, then you tend to get earlier onset of symptoms. And we know that exercise at high intensity or high volumes, so high volume endurance exercise, ultramarathons, endurance cycling, can lead to disease progression and worse outcomes. And we know that if you are someone who's diagnosed and you're very active, if you reduce your exercise intensity and volumes to moderate intensity and lower volumes, then you have a substantial decrease in your risk of arrhythmias. So in this group, therefore, we know that actually you shouldn't be doing any more than low to moderate intensity exercise. You should be avoiding high intensity exercise altogether, which if you're someone who's previously been incredibly active is a very hard thing to hear. And I've worked alongside and counseled people who have being professional athletes or semi-professional, and it's been a big part of their life. And it is a huge adjustment to then only be able to do low to moderate intensity exercise. We know that it is possible to be moderate intensity if you've got no history of symptoms and if on exercise testing you show very little. But if you do, or if you are someone that's had unexplained syncope, cardiac arrhythmias, um, cardiac arrest, you shouldn't even really be doing moderate intensity exercise. So you're limited to walking, 
golf bowls, the lower intensity exercise. That's so really hard to hear. And if you want to speak to me at the end, if, that's, if you're affected by that, I'm happy to, to talk with you because I know that's quite a significant change in activity for some people. And what about dilated cardiomyopathy? We know that that group, pres you know, the presentation varies widely. Um, high intensity sport can be a cause of sudden cardiac death, particularly for those with a low ejection fraction, so poor pumping function, and those who have symptoms from their condition. But we do also know that exercise intensity does improve function and quality of life. More cautious if you carry these particular mutations. And um, I'm glad you're going to have access to the recording and the slides after this, because I know some of the font on this is really quite small. Um, but the recommendations are, you can see, low to moderate intensity exercise is safe and appropriate. But high intensity exercise, again, unlikely. What about exercising with an ICD? Who in the room has an implanted defibrillator? A good scattering of hands. There are some particular things you need to be aware of. For six weeks after you've had an ICD inserted, then you have to restrict your shoulder movement to 90 degrees flexion and trying to avoid any extremes of movement. And that's just to allow the leads to fully embed into that heart muscle. Beyond that six weeks, we wouldn't restrict your shoulder movement. So you can then go about everyday activities. The only things we really would avoid are end of range repetitive motions. Rowing is an example. So with rowing, you're doing right at the end of range of um, shoulder extension, and it's very repetitive. There is a small risk that those end of range repetitive movements can cause lead failure. But it's weighing up that risk benefit. If you say, but rowing is my life, I love rowing, you take the chance of that lead failure and you continue with rowing. I always feel it should be an informed decision. No one should ever tell you what you can't do. You're just informed about the risks. What if my ICD thinks that when I exercise and my heart rate goes up, that's an irregular rhythm and it might shock me? What you should know about ICDs is they're incredibly clever. They are continually monitoring your heart rate and they get used to what your heart rate does. They get used to the gaps between your heartbeats. They get used to what your heart rate does when you exercise. And therefore, over time, it becomes incredibly clever at recognising the difference between a sinus tachycardia that you just get with exercise and a sinus arrhythmia that is dangerous. So the, the um, incidence of people having inappropriate shocks when they exercise is incredibly low because these bits of kit are so clever. They're mini computers. I heard them described earlier as just a battery. They're way more than just a battery. They're very, very clever. What I would, however, suggest is that when you're exercising, you monitor your heart rate when you first start exercising and you keep your upper limit at about 20 beats below the shock threshold of your device. So when you have a device put in, they'll tell you what your shock thresholds are. So at what heart rate would your device give you a shock if it was inappropriate? Keep it below that. Now, most of you will be on beta blockers, I'm sure. So actually, your heart rates are never going to reach 200 anyway. But just to be sure, Keep it just below that. And what about contact sports? Again, for me, this is about informed choice. If you're a rugby player and you love your rugby, carry on playing. But be aware that if you have a big impact on your chest, it's going to cause you quite a bruise. It's actually very unlikely to break the device. They're very, very strong. It's more likely to give you a big bruise. It's probably not going to affect the functioning of the device at all. Be aware on the impact on others that guy who came into you is going to feel terrible. <laughs> All right? So it's not just the impact on you. So be aware there are risks with contact sport, but that shouldn't put you off. It should just inform you about the risk. What about exercise in water? Exercise in water has loads of benefits, but there are some cautions if you've got cardiomyopathy. Most of those are actually around the effect of immersion in water. So whenever we immerse ourselves in water up to our neck, whether that be in a swimming pool or in the bath, the pressure of that water on the outside of your body, it's called hydrostatic pressure, pushes all your body fluid, so it's all the body fluid under your skin, towards your heart and lungs. 
So what that means is when we immerse ourselves in water, our heart and lungs have to work a bit harder than if we're on land. If we then exercise in water, then it has to work even harder still. So just be aware of that. If you have reduced pumping function of your heart, then exercise in water is going to be harder for your heart than exercising on land. And there are a few things we can do to try and negate that risk. Get into water gradually. So rather than dive in, get in at the shallow end. Walk up and down for a bit with the water at waist height to let your body get used to being in water. That will, the shift of fluid will then happen more gradually and your heart will cope with it better. Get out of water gradually. Walk up and down the shallow end before you get out and then your body gets used to being out of water more gradually. And be aware of how you feel during and after exercise in water. If you've taken up exercise in water and you feel shattered the next day, it might not be the right exercise for you. It might be your heart's not coping with being in water. A quick slide on cardiac rehab. So I deliver cardiac rehab, which is a structured exercise session and health education for anyone with heart disease of any kind. And all of you are eligible for cardiac rehab. We know, however, it is a postcode service. And there are many areas of the country where only those who have heart attacks and open heart surgery get access, which saddens me deeply because I feel like everybody with heart failure and cardiomyopathy can benefit. I would say ask whoever you're under, your cardiologist, your specialist nurse, your GP, for a referral. Find out where your local service is and ask. And all of that will increase the awareness of the need for cardiac rehab. I'm part of a couple of national groups that are looking at increasing access and uptake and quality of cardiac rehab. A couple of, I'm aware of time, a couple of very quick slides on how do I get started and how do I get going. How do I get started? If you're inactive at the moment, start by reducing your sitting time. Don't start with exercise. Start with just being more active in your day. Get up on your feet more. Do more things that enable you just to be on your feet more and get more active. Build it into your every day. Get off the bus or stop earlier. Use the stairs rather than the lift. If you can't climb to the third floor, don't worry about climbing all the three floors. Get out the lift at the second floor. Walk the last flight. And once you've been doing that for a couple of weeks, it will get easier. Choose something you enjoy doing. There's no one right form of exercise or activity. The right form is one that you enjoy doing and that you can fit into your life amongst all your other priorities. And think about whether you enjoy being on your own or with others and whether you enjoy being indoors or outdoors. And all those things will inform your choice. How do we keep going? The hardest bit. Set some goals. Know what you're aiming for. Make sure those goals are achievable, that they're not too far in the distance. Choose something that's about four or six weeks away. And then once you've achieved it, that will empower you to then continue. You can read the rest. So in summary, exercise is beneficial and recommended for everyone with cardiomyopathy. Those groups at higher risk might need to be more cautious with the intensity or make some adaptations. For all of us, we should be warming up and cooling down and getting the exercise intensity right and progressing gradually. And for those of us wanting to attempt higher intensity or competitive exercise, only do it after quite thorough testing and screening and get referred to your local cardiac rehab. That's me, any questions? I think if you just wait for the microphone, fantastic. Yeah, it's just behind you. Thanks, Helen. I mean, that was really informative. I mean, I've had an ICD for about 20, 25 years. I've never even heard of cardiac re rehabilitation teams, I've got to be honest. And I don't think any sort of, and I think the clinical treatment has been excellent I've, I've received, but I've, I've never received any of this guidance before, so thank you very much. Practicalities, though, you talked about a self-referral. Is that GP? Or is it your cardiologist, cardio, cardio, cardiac surgeon, whatever? The reason I ask that is that my centre for where I, have, I get my ICD replaced, etc., and rehabbed is actually quite a real, real, reasonable distance away. But my GP surgery, um, well, it's, it's very difficult to get contact them for anything. So short yeah. of actually going up the heart block, 
I'm not going to get an appointment. So practically at the moment, how are you finding this at yeah, the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Take down that website address. That website address there is a national cardiac rehab program finder. So you can put your postcode in and find out where is your local cardiac rehab program. Be aware that some centres act on your own postcode. Some will be that your GP's postcode. So if your GP is in a different borough to where you live, which is not uncommon, it might actually be worth putting your GP's code in to become a commissioned locally by their GP service. So you can self-refer. If you are going to self-refer, I suggest you gather all that clinical data that they will need. So your most recent letter from your cardiologist, your most recent echocardiogram report, your most recent ICD report when you had your last checkup, all of that will really inform the cardiac rehab team and enable them to prescribe exercise safely. If they haven't got enough information, they should come back to you or your GP or cardiologist to gather that. Be aware, not everywhere will accept the referral. Some are commissioned only for certain groups. But over time, if we all ask the question, it raises the awareness of the need. Hello. Um, I, I had my ICD fitted at Bart's, and as you said earlier, I was told not to put my arm forward and above, which I didn't for uh, ages. And now it's gone into... Uh, I was not offered any cardiac rehab at Bart's, and I was amazed to hear that that's what you do. So um, how, if you are a patient at Bart's, how do you get referred to you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good question. I, um, I worked for the NHS for over 20 years, and about a year ago I've actually started working for Nuffield Health Barts, which is right next door to NHS Barts, but not part of. So we provide a, a private cardiac rehab service um, that is either accessible through self-pay or insurance. Um, but I, you can get in touch with NHS Barts via this um, address. And even if you haven't had a recent event, you can say, I was never offered at the time. Can I get access now? I can't guarantee the answer is yes. But I always say to patients, ask the question. It raises awareness. Hi, it's not a question, it's just so people know. Um, I was diagnosed during COVID, and obviously what you guys could do is very limited. Um, I was offered it straight away, a cardiac rehab, and it was basically phone calls, and I was sent a resistance band in, in the post, and a booklet that, that thick on my doorstep, which was lovely, and they were lovely, and eventually they signed me off. At the time, I wasn't ready. I was mentally trying to deal with the diagnosis and what it meant. Um, two years later, I now need it, and I said to my nurse, any chance I can be referred again? I know I've been signed off. She went, absolutely. So Brilliant. people just don't right. think you've been through it once, you yes. can't do it again. Yeah. Absolutely. And yes, like many healthcare services during the pandemic, um, some cardiac rehab programs had to close entirely, um, mine did, because we were redeployed. So I was redeployed to intensive care for quite some months and our cardiac rehab program wasn't seen as a priority and had to close completely. And then on the emerging from the pandemic, a lot of places have lost the venues they used to exercise in. Some have lost their staff. So some are struggling to get back to face-to-face, -to -face. Um, but many, programs that were offering virtually and remotely have now gone back to face-to-face -face services. So yes, no, if you if you missed out during the pandemic, ask to get re-referred. You're still eligible. Good. Fantastic. I'm so pleased to hear that. Um, thank you so much for this. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to feel very emotional because I don't have the condition, but my husband does. And I would say probably when he was first diagnosed, when he had his first ICD, and then we had a lot of, um, he got gout and he had lots of joint issues. So he went from being, as Professor uh, McKenna once said, in the top third of athletes, to someone, um, when he had his last ICD done in 2017, more or less told, well, if he played tennis, he had to stand literally <laughs> at the, you know, to do anything. Mm -hmm. And we, like everyone said, we weren't, off, offered any of this, probably because we don't live in London, we live in Surrey, and we did eventually have to fight, well, we didn't, we did eventually get some cardiac rehab, but he had joint issues at times, so he couldn't totally engage. His weight's gone up, he's not highly motivated anymore to exercise, 
He is, he's, he's in, per in permanent AF anyway with, um, he's had an ab um, AV node ablation, but it seems to be. But <laughs> I, it just breaks my heart because I just feel that had we known more of what we could have pushed for, and even the GPs don't want to mention alcohol or restriction too much. They, it's almost like they're terrified they want to pussyfoot around it because they're terrified of upsetting someone. And it's very hard, I think, that, you know, you, sometimes you just don't know where to start. And then what, the preventative bit, which is fantastic, hearing what you're saying, is, is wonderful. And someone sitting on the outside looking in, it's quite hmm. tough. Yes. It is hard. I would say start with anything. I think very often people think, well, it's been too long. I've never, I've never been active or I've, I've been inactive in so long I don't know where to start. Starting with a five-minute walk in the morning and again in the afternoon, keep that going and gradually build up the distance and build up the pace. So start small. Start with something achievable. Start with something that you can make part of your routine and then think about building up gradually. Uh, Helen, thank you for, um, I think, a phenomenally clear talk. Thank I could you. relate very well about catching the bus, like catching the tube and running the tube. When you get the tube, you feel relief, but you don't feel that well. The moment you get, enter the tubes, um, the, 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 the train or what, you, don't, you have that sense of feeling unwell for a moment before it relieved. I would just like to inquire, uh, you mentioned a few symptoms, right, that they're not supposed to have. One of it is palpitation. Mm -hmm. How patients, they can't get away of palpitation, even do um, moderate intensity of exercise. They do have that palpitation, mm -hmm. but not that severe, but it's fully reversible and back to baseline, just about 10 minutes, and they feel better, good night's sleep, but they just can't get away of that symptoms despite of uh, going slow with the exercise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, palpitations is a, a tricky symptom, isn't it? I would say if it's something your doctor knows about, and you're medicated for it, then it doesn't concern me. Often when we exercise, an irregular heart rate becomes, your heart rate will still go up with exercise, but it will just be irregular when you're exercising. Um, but I would say if, it, if we know about it and it's medicated for, then it, it doesn't concern me. I was more talking about new palpitations. So if you're someone that don't, doesn't tend to have them and then they emerge when you're exercising, that's a bit different, get them checked out. The other thing to say about palpitations and exercise, actually, um, heart rate monitoring during exercise can be really helpful. It's not essential. I prefer people to use how they're feeling and how they're breathing. But for some people, they find it helpful. If you've got atrial fibrillation, then heart rate monitors are notoriously inaccurate. So don't bother. Because it will pick up. It will say 86, oh, 108, 112. Oh, it will go up and down. Oh, God. Um, so if you've got atrial fibrillation, don't expect heart rate monitoring to be accurate. The numbers will jump around and concern you. Think more about your breathing. It's incredibly accurate, thinking about how warm and breathless you are once you get used to how your body feels when you exercise. I think some of us can become too dependent on the numbers, especially with the fantastic smartwatches available. Um, it has a place. For some people, it really has a place, but use your breathing as a guide. Hi, Helen. Um, I've yeah, been in honour of actually being under your care at um, Guys and St Thomas's. I know that the cardiac rehab programme there is very, very good. And I've done it twice because I had it when I got first diagnosed seven and a half years ago. And I got it when I had my ICD, both by yourself and your team at the time. Now that we are kind of post-pandemic, I'd just like to know your... Um, your opinion on how the cardiac rehab um, program will change um, over definitely over the next 12 or 18 months, seeing as the one at St Thomas's that you are obviously part of um, last year, the year before, um, is now a reduced program. So I'm I, I mean, I'm not sure how it will be um, through other institutions or health institutions, but I just want to know what your opinion would be over the next 12 or 18 months, how you think that could change. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on the um, British Association of Cardiac Rehab Council. Um, and, you know, part of our work is to try and over time improve the quality and the provision of cardiac rehab across the country. And as I said earlier, we know that some centres are still recovering from the pandemic and have lost staff and venues. Um, 
Going forward, all patients should be an offered a choice of cardiac rehab at a venue and in a way that suits them. So for some people, that will be virtual and remote access, and that will be the most accessible form of cardiac rehab. But you should also be offered the choice to come face to face. You should be offered the choice to come to a venue that suits you, whether that be a gym, a hospital, or a community venue. So we know that going forwards, the only way we're going to increase access and uptake of cardiac rehab is making sure it's individualized, it's personalized, and there is choice, because we know that one size doesn't fit all. But that's aspirational, and we know that funding um, cuts have affected many services. Um, but I would say if you're not happy with the service, say something about it. Highlight that to your GP, highlight it to your specialist nurse, and those will have a responsibility to highlight that to commissioners. If you don't make noise about it, people never hear. So, oh, hi. Um, you said something at the start of your presentation about uh, your adrenaline rising. Mm -hmm and then going down, um, my, my health journey is that my adrenal gland no longer works. Right. So I'm on a, a daily prescribed amount. Mm. So it doesn't have that increase or a fluctuation down. Uh, that's the first time I've heard about that. So do I need to take that into consideration when trying to get back into exercise? Because what happens with me is my body hates. I was a bit like that lady's husband. I was fit, had all the health problems, and now I've put on tons of weight, and I just can't shift it because... Mm. Uh, I don't do much exercise, I'm very sedentary, yeah. and whenever I do try and get into it, my body says, right, you're, I'm going to give you joint ache or whatever it is, mm. and I'm back to square one, and I just think, oh, what the heck, Blow, yeah. I'm not going to bother anymore. Yeah. When we, when we exercise, there are kind of two systems that interact with each other. The one is hormonal, but one also is our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So your body, will, your heart rate will still increase with exercise, as will your blood pressure, but it might take a bit longer. So for you, it's just that warm-up is going to be especially important and the cool-down especially important because your hormone levels are affected. So you will still see an, a rise in your heart rate when you exercise, I'm sure, but it might just be a more gradual process. I think we have time for one more, two more. Maybe, maybe two. <laughs> uh, f thanks for the talk, very interesting. Prior to my condition... Uh, my exercise was moderate to intense. Uh, Post-condition, it's more moderate now. Mm. But what I'm finding is that my recovery takes a lot longer. So I'm a bit like this gentleman. Mm. I'm a bit loath to do the exercise. And I'm, I, I was doing lots of different sports prior. Mm. Um, but my concern is that I'm damaging my heart mm because it's taken a lot longer to recover. Um, um, by maybe. that, do you mean sort of uh, in the days following the exercise? How do you feel? Well, how no, do you... It's, it's almost immediately after. Um, 24 hours later, yeah, I'm okay. So is it fatigue? Um, sorry? Fatigue, breathlessness? Well, I don't get fatigue. I don't... I get a little bit breathless, but I just don't have... Well, maybe this is fatigue. I just don't have the, the stamina to, to do the whole what I want to do. So you do the exercise, but afterwards your energy levels are so low. Yes, I suppose so, yes. Yeah. I haven't really analysed it, uh, hence coming to this seminar. I would say play with the dose of exercise. So mm. if what you're doing is making you feel exhausted or tired for a day or two later, then start to shorten what you're doing. So try reducing the duration or the mm. intensity and find a dose that, energizes you exercise should energize you you should feel energized after and beyond the exercise and if you're not getting that if you're getting dips in energy afterwards then play with the dosage we've got frequency intensity and duration to play with so play with those things until you feel you get it right you might need to start doing something less intense but a little more frequently well maybe exercise is the wrong term i'm using um, i would have come to this conference mm under my own steam. I only live quite local. I would have cycled here. Mm. But I got the train today, you know. Um, yeah. Whereas before, I just wouldn't have thought of getting the train. Mm. It's, it's those sort of psychological thoughts that keep on... And I'm sure many in the room well, will, yeah. Yeah, will mirror that. These questions are very similar. I yeah, think. yeah. I would say sometimes just play with the dosage, sometimes doing something a bit less intense and more frequently, and then building it up gradually can mean you're strengthening... And um, 
aerobic fitness improve to the point where you then don't feel exhausted? Mm. No easy answers. Go on, last thing. Question yeah, there. I'll make this last one. I mean, actually, this is not actually a question, but it's just a really comment I've just been thinking through while you, your mm. sage advice. And speaking to this young lady up here as well, I live in Surrey as well. Um, one of the things that's come to mind, my, my wife had a very serious um, uh, health issue as well. And one of the things I'm recognising, she goes, fortunately, she's got a little women's only gym right beside her. And I'm always push her to go out of the house in the morning. One of the reasons, it's actually not so much the exercise, it's the sociability aspect of it. And just thinking about this lady here, I know when I first got diagnosed, I mean, I'm, I'm still playing volleyball now. I'm now thinking maybe I should go down to it, but it's the sociability aspect. And I think it's one of those things us blokes don't cope with very, very well. And I think maybe one of the things I'm thinking about the rehab here is, is just getting that sociability issue. I mean, one thing I'm actually maybe thinking going away today, I'm a Fulham supporter. Uh, that's my stress causing part of my life. But the club have been very helpful in that they actually sponsored a, a gentleman of a certain age who actually do some sports things like walking football and things like that. Mm. So maybe I'm half thinking that maybe maybe getting a group of us, maybe around the southwest London, Surrey area, maybe just get informally have some walking football because it's as much to do with the, shall I call it a pint afterwards, as yeah. it is the exercise. Yeah. And I think it's the mental issues that are, in some respects, I think more important than the the exercise aspects yeah, of and that can be that can be the bit that keeps you going yeah so joining a group if you are a sociable person joining a group then that can or even partnering with someone who who goes out and walk the same time of day as you meeting up with others who walk their dogs at the same time that can be the bit that keeps you going yeah i won't get a dog <laughs> no no too much hassle <laughs> Thank you, Helen. I think we could have probably gone on for a little bit longer, but I'm aware that we've only got a 15-minute break before the next session. So please thank Helen. <laughs>